It sure is hot today. Oh no! My favorite plant! It's all dried up! I forgot it is sensitive to heat and easily dries up, especially on a hot day like today. Well, at least some of my plants are still fresh and healthy. Although all plants belong to Kingdom Plantae under domain Eukarya, they still differ from one another and have their own characteristics. Some thrive despite the hot weather while others are sensitive to heat, like my favorite plant. Plants under Kingdom Plantae are further classified into non-flowering plants and flowering plants. And flowering plants are further divided into two types, conifers and fruit-bearing. Dr. Josette Tibio, a world-class educator and the first Asian to win the Intel International Excellence in Teaching Award, will take us to a forest to learn more about Plant Kingdom. Hello, Teacher Abby. Hello, Kay Habers. You know, teaching may not be necessarily confined within a classroom. A garden or any outside environment can be a wonderful laboratory for studying about living organisms. Good day students. Today we will learn about plants. Look at these plants. They're beautiful, aren't they? So you can see even a school garden can be a wonderful laboratory for studying plants. The Philippines is a home to some of the most beautiful plant species in the world. Do you know that in the Philippines, about 14,500 plant species have been identified? Out of this total number of species, about 6,000 are endemic. When we say endemic, they are native to this country. They are found only in the Philippines and nowhere else in the world. The diversity of our plant species is truly amazing. Ma'am, what is meant by biodiversity? When we talk about biodiversity, it means the variety of living organisms on this planet. When we talk about plant biodiversity, that means the abundance, the diversity, and the distribution of plants in our ecosystems. You see, Plants live in a diverse ecosystem. They can be found in aquatic habitats like our rivers, our lakes, and our seas, but majority of them can be found in our terrestrial habitats, on land, in the forest, in lowlands, and even in the highest mountains. But are you also aware that despite the fact that we have so many species of plants in the country, many of these plants are already endangered? In fact, some are already on the verge of extinction. I think some of our species have already gone extinct without our even knowing that these plants are existing. That is the reason why some of the scientists consider the Philippines as one of the 10 hotspots in the world. What is meant by hotspot? When we say hotspots, these are areas where there are so many species of plants. In other words, there is an abundance and species diversity. Endemism is also high. In other words, there are many native plant species. However, these areas are experiencing rapid habitat loss. What makes a plant different from other organisms? Look at its plants. What is their most dominant color? They are mostly green. Yes, most plants are green because they possess chlorophyll. Chlorophyll enables plants to undergo photosynthesis so plants can manufacture their own food, and we call them autotrophic. Ma'am, this leaf is not green. Does it also have chlorophyll? Yes. While that plant may have red leaves, it also has chlorophyll. 
Plants possess other pigments aside from chlorophyll. They may have red pigments, yellow pigments, or orange pigments. What enables the plants to live successfully on land? Plants have developed adaptations to enable them to live successfully on land. Now look at this plant. What enables this plant to stand firm on the ground? The roots. Very good, Alfonso. The roots anchor the plant to the ground. The roots also absorb water and nutrients, which are delivered to the different parts of the plant. Now, look at these leaves. What have you observed? The leaves are waxy. This waxy substance coating the leaves is what we call cuticle. Cuticle prevents rapid water evaporation from the plants. The loss of water through evaporation in plants is what we call transpiration. The leaves also contain openings which we call the stomata. In fact, the stomata are called the breathing organs of the leaves. Carbon dioxide, which is needed in photosynthesis, enters the leaves via the stomata. Oxygen, which is a byproduct of photosynthesis, exits the plants also through the stomata. But the stomata closes when there is scarce water. Plant cells also have cell walls. The cell walls produce a hardening substance called lignin. That is why the stems, the trunk, and the bark of the plants are hard. This is because of lignin. These hard structures enable the plants to stand firm on the ground. Plants also grow tall. That is one adaptation so that they can have an abundant supply of sunlight needed for photosynthesis. Aside from that, plants have also developed vascular tissues. When we talk about vascular tissues, these are the xylem cells and the phloem cells. The xylem cells delivers water from the roots to the other parts of the plant. The phloem cells, on the other hand, carries food produced by photosynthesis from the leaves to the other parts of the plant. So aside from these structures, plants have also developed adaptation in response to extreme environmental conditions. In some polar countries, during winter, and in extreme hot conditions during summer, plants would shed off their leaves. These leaves will grow again when environmental conditions are favorable. How are plants classified and how many groups are there? Generally, plants are classified as the bryophytes or tracheophytes. Bryophytes are non-vascular plants. When we say non-vascular, they do not have xylem cells or phloem cells that conduct water and food within the plant. Tracheophytes, on the other hand, are vascular plants. Vascular plants have xylem cells which carries water from the roots to the different parts of the plants. They also have phloem cells which carries food from the leaves to the other parts of the plants. Tracheophytes, however, are classified into three major groups. We have the ferns and their allies, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms. What are examples of bryophytes and where do we usually find them? Now look at this. These are examples of bryophytes. These are mosses. Mosses don't have true roots, stems, or leaves, but they have means of absorbing water and nutrients from the ground. They usually live in moist places and they can be found in abundance in the forest floors. However, they do not produce flowers and seeds. They cannot grow tall because they don't have vascular tissues. They reproduce by means of spores. Spores can be dispersed by water and they develop into new plants. Why is it that there seems to be more flowering plants than gymnosperms or bryophytes? 
Flowering plants are very successful because of the fact that they can produce flowers. Flowers develop into fruits which contain seeds. Fruits and seeds enable these plants to be dispersed widely in the ecosystem. Tracheophytes are vascular plants. They have xylem cells and phloem cells. That's why they can grow tall. Tracheophytes are classified into three groups. This plant is commonly called the horsetail. Its scientific name is Equisitum. This is another example of a vascular plant which does not produce seeds. This is an example of a fern ally. Just like the ferns, they reproduce by means of spores. These are examples of spores produced by the ferns. When these spores fall to the ground, they develop into new plants. These are also spores of the ferns. So, the ferns reproduce by means of these structures. When the spores fall to the ground, they develop into new fern plants. The cycad is an example of a gymnosperm. Gymnosperms are tracheophytes that produce seeds but do not produce flowers and fruits. They, however, produce cones and each cone produces ovules. The male cone produces sperm cells. Gymnosperms like pines produce seeds in naked cones. Gymnosperms produce seeds but they do not produce flowers and fruits. Each cone is composed of scales. Each scale contains egg cells. When the egg cells are pollinated and are fertilized by the sperm cells, the scale falls off to the ground and develops into a new plant. What is a monocot and a dicot? That's a very good question, Alfonso. Traditionally, flowering plants are categorized as monocots and dicots based on internal and external structures. Recently, however, scientists classified flowering plants into three groups. We have the monocots, the dicots or the true dicots, also known as yodicots, and the paleodicots. Look at this plant. Examine its leaves. How would you describe the leaf venation? The veins of the leaf are parallel. Okay, the veins of the leaves are parallel. This is an example of a monocot. Monocots have parallel veins in their leaves. Let's compare this with another plant. Examine the leaves of these plants. How would you describe the leaf venation? The veins of that leaf are netted. Okay, so this is an example of a true dicot or a eudicot. It has netted veins in its leaves. Now let us compare a monocot and a dicot in terms of the structure of the flowers. Now this plant has these flowers. Let us examine an example of a flower of this plant. Count the number of petals. How many petals are there? Two, three, four, five, six. There are six petals in here, and they have also six stamens. The stamens contain the pollen grains, and the pollen grains contain the sperm cell of the flower. Monocots like these have flower parts in multiples of three. So they can have three petals, six petals, nine or twelve. Let us compare this with an example of a dicot. Count the number of petals. One, two, three, four, five. True dicots have flower parts in multiples of four or five. To summarize, monocots have leaves with parallel veins. They have flower parts in multiples of threes. While dicots have leaves with netted veins and their flower parts are in multiples of four or five. Another difference between a monocot and a true dicot is in terms of their root structure. How will you describe its roots? Is it sturdy or is it fibrous? It is fibrous. Okay, monocot plants have fibrous roots. Look at this plant. This is an example of a dicot. Observe its roots. Unlike the monocot which has fibrous roots, 
a dicot has a primary root from which secondary roots emerge. But one of the most distinguishing characteristics of monocots and dicots is in terms of their seed coats. Monocots have only one seed coat, while dicots have two seed coats. Aside from monocots and dicots, we have another group of flowering plants. These plants have flower parts in multiples of three, just like a monocot. But when you examine their leaf structures, they have netted veins, just like dicots. These are called paleodicots. They are paleodicots because scientists believe that they evolved first. They were the first flowering plants to evolve on Earth. Students, I hope you enjoyed our lessons today. Bye! We have learned that through photosynthesis, plants produce oxygen and absorb carbon dioxide, cleaning the atmosphere for life to survive. A change in temperature and precipitation affects a plant's capability to carry out photosynthesis. That's why both excessive drought or excessive rainfall have a detrimental effect on plants. If exposed to too much heat, plants become stressed and in many cases die. That's why global warming has a huge impact on the survival of plants and subsequently animal and human life. We can help prevent global warming by planting more trees. Trees provide clean air and water, thus saving other flowers, animals and human life as well. See you next time, Kihubbers! Bye!